I may ask uh, Rick Torfs from the Catholic University of Leuven in, uh, in Belgium to speak to us about pain and social affairs. Thank you uh, very much. I'm uh, extremely glad to be here. However, it won't be the best uh, speech of the day. I'm more or less incompetent on the topic. And I have uh, no PowerPoint presentation, so the summary will be no power, no point. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, I will try to develop my team in five points, and I also say that right away so that you know when things will be finished, most of the time the best moment of my speeches. Maybe a first remark, <clears throat> and here I join uh, what has been said before the break. I think that there will always be pain, so it's impossible to outrule it. The question is not in my eyes how to eliminate it, but the question is how to make life livable, with not too much pain. And that's a more realistic ambition, politically speaking, but also emotionally. I know about politicians who say or tell publicly what we need is zero road accident victims a year. Zero. Well, it's impossible. As long as there is a road, there will be accidents, and we need a road. And the same is true for pain, we can't eliminate it, we have to make life livable. And that's already quite a success. So I come to my second point, so you see things are moving. The second point, point is the issue of physical pain as such. And <clears throat> what always strikes me is that ultimately physical pain, in a way, in its deepest feeling, is stronger than mental pain which in a way causes to some people, including intellectuals, mental pain. Because deep in the heart people think, well, we should be more influenced by what touches our heart and not so much by what we feel physically. But we see, and I had on that regard discussions with uh, great philosophers, when physical pain is too overwhelming, then mental pain disappears or the problems we are thinking about become less important. That's an important issue. I think we, we don't realize enough how physical pain influences our thinking, our sorrows, our intellectual depth, and of course, our ability to function in society. So I come to my third point, and that is the issue of mental pain. And here is also a, a connection, I think, between mental pain and physical pain that we should try to frame well. An underlying value in our society is that implicitly we lead, in a way, vertical lives with ups and downs. We make a career, we make promotion, we dislike degradation, that's human. We don't believe really, and that's maybe a male weakness, we don't believe in horizontal moves, we think we should always go forward. And so we have also a perspective about our future. And people doing well, still feeling okay, still feeling young, not with, notwithstanding certain external characteristics telling the opposite, but anyway, feeling young and doing well, those people start having fear about the future. Fear also for what that future will be, what they will be like in a few years, what the role of pain, physical and mental, will be in their lives. The fear for decline. And I think that's a very important element. People today, are psychologically influenced by what may happen in the future, by their future perspective. And if they get the impression that one day they will be eliminated from society because they are becoming too slow, they have too much pain, they are not entirely in line anymore with new requirements, then the weakness may already be felt right now. 
So the idea of future pain can be psychologically very burdensome today, and that's also, I think, an element we have to take into account. So there's a kind of circle. The mental pain, with regard to the physical pain of the future, creates also new problems today. That's my third point, mental pain. But after the physical and the mental pain, the two topics I already tackled, I would also like to deal, as in my fourth point, with the issue of social pain. And here we are confronted with negative attitudes vis-à-vis -vis people who are suffering from pain. When you just say, I feel pain, people look at it badly. It's not something they recognize. It's not something they feel at ease with. It makes me think in a way of, it's maybe a silly comparison, but I don't have any other, embarkation cards when you enter another country or continent, and then you have to indicate why you want to enter the country. And a few possibilities are mentioned. Studies, holidays, business, and I always wonder, yeah, but what am I doing here as a professor, going to a conference? Is it studying, not really? Holiday, well, life as a whole is a holiday, but that's too philosophical for that invocation card. <laughs> business, can a conference be called business? And so there I am, no place on the embarkation card. And that's maybe also true for pain. It's too elusive. There is no recognition, no official status. People feel abandoned socially because of pain, very difficult to identify. Another element of social pain are the false dilemmas. Sometimes you are successful in making your point. Sometimes you are not. Maybe just another example. When you are young, and fortunately for you, most of you are in the dark, I can't see the opposite. But when you are young and you are critical, then people say, oh, that young person, critical mind, we need people like that. When you are old and you are critical, then you are called a grumpy old man. <laughs> Even if you say exactly the same thing. And that's a problem. When you have pain, you are maybe a grumpy old man. That's the way how you will be qualified. Because the disease is not noble enough. If it is already a disease, that's the point. Is it a disease or a symptom? But in any case, it's not noble enough. People say, okay, that guy is complaining. So a low social status of pain is certainly not a good thing. And we should bring that more under the attention of people. And so, I come to my fifth and last point. I admire very much what you are doing here. Because what you are doing deals with quality of life going together with a long life. Not as a kind of dilemma. And I like both elements. Living a long time, 100 years, I don't say no, why not a bit longer, by the way? but also a good quality of life, not a horrible pain. And I think that the political option of the future or choice will truly be the choice between the right to live and the right to rest. Politically, it's quite an issue. Many people want an early retirement in their early 50s, for instance. But what does it mean, retirement? What does it mean? resting. It's fine to do it one day, two days, a week, two weeks, but what about two years, 20 years, 30 years of full rest, pure contemplation? Of course, you can have a tremendous spiritual depth, but most of the time it's too long anyway, even for people who are very gifted in that way. And so I think we should not opt for the right to rest, but for the right to live which keeps people active, professionally, if possible. But being active, of course, can also be being active after the age of retirement. 
but not by resting. So we have to make choices between investing in a lot of pensions and retirement money and the other possibility, investing in healthcare. Healthcare in the very broad sense, people living for a long time and doing that well, enjoying it. I think that's a bit the idea for the future. And I'm very happy that you are working in that direction. And it was a pleasure for me to be with people who are highly motivated professionally and emotionally in that task. Thank you very much.